In this video, we're going to look at how using a derivative can give us a general idea of the shape of our graph. So what I'm kind of referring to in that sense is when we started talking about derivatives, kind of back in chapter, I think, three it was, or it was at the beginning of the semester, we were using uh, shapes of graphs to give us a general sense of what the graph of the, of the derivative would look like. Well, now that we've been exposed to processes of how to take derivatives and all that kind of stuff, we're going to flip that process on its head. We're going to use the derivative to tell us certain things about our function. And namely, they're the three questions that we have seen here inside of our prompt. We're going to find where f has a relative max, a relative min, and we're going to also going to figure out the intervals where f is increasing and where f is decreasing. Okay, so when we talk about all that, we're like, yeah, we can do that, but how do we do that? Well, a lot of these relative max, local min, increasing, decreasing, all that has to do, all three of these really, have to do with the first derivative, right? So let's go ahead and start looking at how to find that. And more specifically, we're not dealing with just the first derivative. We're going to be dealing with critical points of the first derivative. So when we look at local max and mins, those can only occur at critical points of our derivative, right? Where our derivative equals zero, or critical points of our function, rather, is where the derivative equals zero. My apologies. And then these intervals that we're going to talk about where f is increasing and decreasing are actually going to be broken up by those critical points. Because this function here that we're talking about, when we don't have an interval uh, that we should be focused on in this question, we can assume that we're dealing with the interval negative infinity to infinity, or all real numbers. And since our answers need to be in interval notation, we'll go ahead and focus on writing with this kind of stuff. But what we're going to do is once we find the critical points of our function, we're going to use them to, to, to divvy up this interval here, this negative infinity to infinity, and figure out where f is increasing and where f is decreasing. So without further ado, let's go ahead and find our derivative of our original function so that we can start looking for the critical points of our function. So our derivative, f prime of x, is going to be the derivative of this function that we have here, which is defined to be a cubic. But we see that this cubic, we can take the derivative of it using the power rule. Okay, So let's use the power rule on each individual term and figure out what our derivative is. For the first term, we get 6x squared, because we bring that 3 down, subtract 1 from the power. Then here we bring this 2 down, and we're going to get minus 2 times 29 over 2. When we multiply 2 and 29 over 2, the 2's will divide away, right? So all we're going to be left with is minus 29x. The power's going to get reduced, and then that's how that happens. Kind of the divided by half and the multiplied by 2 divide each other away by the multiplicative uh, inverse property. So then what we have for this last term here, the power rule of something with an exponent of 1, just becomes that constant, that leading coefficient, right? So here we have plus 20. And a constant, its derivative is 0, so we have our derivative right here. And we see that this derivative is a quadratic, right? So what that means is this is defined for all of our x's, especially over negative infinity to infinity, right? We don't have any points where this derivative could be undefined, so all we're really going to be needing to find is where f prime of x equals 0. These will give us our critical points. Okay, so let's now let's go ahead and set the derivative equal to 0 and solve this. So we get 0 equals 6x squared minus 29x plus 20. When we have this set equal to 0, we can do a lot of things with this, but we can actually factor this quadratic right here. And so I'm going to go ahead and do just that. So if we put this quadratic through any factoring method that you know or appreciate how to do, what we're going to find is this factors to 6x minus 5 times x minus 4. And then, once we have this linear factor times this linear factor multiplied together to equal 0, by using the zero product property, we can set both of these equal to 0 and solve for x in each individual case. Well, this case that we just did on the right here, if we add 4 to both sides, we're going to get x equals 4. So x equals 4 is one of our critical points we need to be worried about. And then what about the other critical point? 6x minus 5 equals 0. What will that give us? Well, if we add 5 to both sides, we're going to get 6x equals 5. And if we divide 6, we're going to get that x equals 5 sixths. 
So here we have our two critical points. We're done evaluating for our critical points. We found them. Now we just need to ask ourselves, well, what do we need to do to figure out where the function's increasing, decreasing, where's our local max and min? At this point, what I like to do is jot myself down a number line to describe the interval that we're dealing with on our original function. And in this case, we're dealing with negative infinity to positive infinity, right? And I like to put zero in there as a frame of reference because zero is kind of involved with a lot of things, but now I know that this side is negative stuff, this side's positive stuff. But what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna plot five sixth and fourth, and no, five sixth and fourth, five sixth and four on this number line in a way that represents where they are because what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna test values inside of the interval that composes the rest of this number line. And what I mean by that is, let me get done writing our critical points. And this is not drawn to scale. Five, six, and four should not be that far apart if this is infinity, but you get kind of the gist of what's going on. So now if we look at our number line here, ignoring the zero, I mean, for the time being, it's not there as a critical point. It's just there as a frame of reference. I like to put dotted lines around my critical points to know where I'm breaking up the interval. But now what we have is we have the intervals negative infinity to 5 sixth. We have 5 sixth to 4. And we have 4 to infinity. The reason why we focus on these intervals and exclude the critical points out of these is because we just found that at those points, the derivative is 0. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to find value or a value in here, a value in here, and a value in here to plug into our derivative to see what value it returns. If it returns a positive value, our function's increasing on that interval. If that value returns a negative value, our function is decreasing on that interval. So that's kind of the whole point of why we divided up the number line that we drew of negative infinity to infinity, because we're going to test values inside of this. So we can pick any number between negative infinity to 5, 6 to test, any number between 5, 6, and 4, and any number between 4 and infinity. For simplicity purposes, I really like to pick numbers like, here in this case, 0. As long as it fits between the two, it's fine. Here I'll pick something like 1, just something simple. We're not here to uh, tax our brain on how to plug in complicated numbers, so let's just keep it simple for ourselves. And then something for 4 to infinity, let's do something like 5, okay? Because all we're really doing is we're plugging in these values to see what sign they return, because that will tell us whether our function is increasing or decreasing on that interval, okay? And so what we're going to actually plug these values into that we found is we're going to plug these into f prime of x, or we're going to find f prime of 0, f prime of 1, and f prime of 5, okay? So I'm going to scroll down here and give myself a little bit more room to work. So here, if we have f prime of 0 equals f prime of 1 equals, and then f prime of 5. This is what we're evaluating. So here, f prime of 0, if we plug in 0 for x, this evaluates to 0, so does this, and all we're left with is 20. And this is a positive 20, right? So what this implies is that this interval, negative infinity to 5 sixth, f is increasing here. Because the value that we got, or were returned when we picked a number inside the interval negative infinity to 5 sixth, it returned a positive value, so our function is increasing on negative infinity to 5 sixth. Well, what about this interval? If we plug in 1, we're going to get 1 squared is 1 times 6, so we get 6 minus 29, because negative 29 times 1 is negative 29, plus 20. And so and then we add 6 and 20 to get 26, but we get negative 29 plus 26, so we get negative 3. This is negative. So what this implies for this interval is that f is decreasing. Okay, so our first interval was increasing, our second was decreasing. Now let's worry about what happens on our last interval. So f prime of 5, we get 6 times 25 minus 29 times 5. What does that work out to be? That works out to be 145 plus 20. 6 times 25 gives us 150 minus, 40, minus 145 plus 20. So what this gives us is 5 plus 20 or 25. But what we're concerned with is that's positive, right? So what this tells us for our last interval here, excuse my long arrows there, f increasing, right? Because our derivative was positive. So now we know that negative infinity to 5 sixths 
and 4 to infinity, f is increasing because our derivative was positive, and on the contrary, on the interval 5, 6 to 4, f is decreasing because our derivative was negative. Okay? So we've effectively answered the third question. We found the intervals where f is increasing, where f is decreasing. But now how do we answer the first two questions? And so what we know about local maxes and mins tells us that if we have intervals next to each other, and I call them next to each other, where like negative infinity and 5, 6, then 5, 6, and 4 are quote unquote next to each other. It's not mathematically precise language, but that's how I like to think about it. But if we have intervals next to each other that go from increasing to decreasing, what this is going to yield is a local max. And on the contrary, if we flip this around, we go from decreasing to increasing. What this is going to give us is a local min. This is kind of um, opposite of what we would think naturally kind of happens. But if we think about our derivative and, what's that, and what that's telling us, we're talking about the function going from increasing to decreasing, right? So if we look at something like a... Uh, upside down quote unquote parabola here, and this is our maximum, our function takes increasing values all the way up to where we get a derivative evaluation of zero here, so this is like a critical point, then it goes to decreasing, right? And if we think of a right side up parabola, we're going from functions that de or function values that decrease till we hit our critical point or our minimum, and then our function values increase. So that's kind of where this comes from. So in our case, we have the case of going from increasing to decreasing at 5 6. So 5 6 is that critical point that kind of breaks up those two intervals right here that we're talking about. So what this means is that at x equals 5 6, we have a local maximum. And then since at x equals 4, we go from decreasing to increasing, we're going to get a local minimum. Okay, so we found where the different mins and max, or the min and max occur. Now let's figure out their values. And all we're really going to do to figure that out is plug these x values into our original function. So let's come down here. So if we evaluate f of 4 and f of 5 6 to figure out what our max and min values are, we're going to get that if we plug 4 into our original function, we're going to return a value of negative 19. And then if we were to put in 5, 6 into our function, we're going to get a value of 2755 or 2755 over 216. I kind of saved you all the process of plugging that into the original function. If you want to, you can evaluate that using a calculator. Um, I just kind of want to save ourselves some breath of not having to worry about doing that. But what this is going to be is since we declared x equals 4, our local min, negative 19 will be our local min value. And then 2755 over 216 is our local max value. So like I said at the beginning of the video, this process that we went through here was kind of flipping something that we already did on its head. At the beginning of the class, really, at the beginning of calculus, we started talking about derivatives and how we can go from the graph of a function and then kind of roughly sketch its derivative and how it looks like. Here, we're kind of flipping that on its head and using more of a algebraic approach and more of a calculus-driven approach as opposed to a graphical approach. That's really all we've been, that's really all we've done.